for this afternoon comes from God's Word as summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism uh, in Lord's Day 4. Let's read that together as a congregation. Lord's Day 4. But does God not do man an injustice by requiring in his law what man cannot do? No, for God so created man that he was able to do it, but man at the instigation of the devil, in deliberate disobedience, robbed himself and all of his descendants of these gifts. Will God allow such disobedience and apostasy to go unpunished? Certainly not. He is terribly angry with our original sin as well as our actual sins. Therefore, he will punish them by a just judgment, both now and eternally. As he has declared, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. But is God not also merciful? God is indeed merciful, but he is also just. His justice requires that sin committed against the most high majesty of God also be punished with the most severe, that is, with everlasting punishment of body and soul. This is the confession of our church, and this is our confession of faith. Dear congregation, this afternoon we will be examining Lord's Day 4, which teaches us about God's justice. That means we'll be learning about God's judgment and his punishment for sin. Today we will be considering the reality of hell. We will examine God's righteousness, his justice, and we will find ourselves guilty of our sin. We will find that our sin is deserving of punishment, even of hell, and this will frighten us as it should. As we learn how we have offended the justice of God, we will learn to fear him all the more. And by this, we will gain a greater love for what Jesus has done for each one of us. As we come to understand what our sin naturally deserves. Let's cling to Christ all the more because we will gain a deeper understanding that he has saved us from hell. Our theme for this afternoon's sermon is our God is just with our sin. Our first point is his justice and our responsibility. Lord's Day 4 asks, if it is unfair for God to keep the same requirements of us after the fall? Is God being unjust by expecting us to do the same level of obedience that he required Adam? Now, as we read question and answer nine, we might see a lot of similarity with what we've covered last week in question and answer six and seven. We will recall that man was created good and able to do good, and then falling into sin. That sounds very familiar to us if we were here last week. We recall that man was made in the image of God, but the fall into sin shattered that image. That, the fall into sin has damaged our ability to do good. But did the fall take away our responsibility? Is God just to expect the same level of, of obedience as Adam? Is this a reasonable request from God? The catechism is clear that God is making a reasonable request. This is not unfair. Now, we might read this and we we might say something like, I can understand being affected by Adam's decision. I can understand why I'm sinful because of what Adam did, but why am I responsible for that? Come on, this is Adam's problem, not ours. But that's not true. 
The Bible tells us he acted for us, with us, and as us. Adam's problem is our problem because we were united in him. In Romans 5 verse 12, it says, death spread to all men because all sinned. And the catechism agrees. It's hard for us to accept and sometimes it's hard for us to understand this. We would like to shift the blame to Adam, the responsibility to him. But we share this responsibility to obey God. The catechism reinforces us by saying, but man, not Adam. We read in answer nine that man, he was put into a difficult situation by the devil. Adam, acting on our behalf, was challenged by the temptation of the devil. Now, did Adam realize the ramifications of the fall? Did he understand what pain would be if he sinned or what damage a lie would have? Adam, he may have been naive to what would have happened from his disobedience, but he knew what was expected of him. In Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, God gave him clear instructions saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There couldn't be a simpler rule. And it doesn't seem very hard to keep either. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't in a desert. It was in the garden, surrounded by other fruit-bearing trees. It was also not a situation where he was at a disadvantage. Man had gifts from God. He was intelligent. He was rational. Answer 9 describes this as deliberate disobedience. Because man knew what the rules were, he was using his brain when he fell into sin. We have robbed ourselves. We made a willful decision about what to do with our gifts. It's like backing up a tool trailer into the lake and then unhitching the trailer. And it might be a bit of a silly analogy for us to think of, but I hope you you can understand the point. Backing up a trailer is a skill and backing into the lake is a choice. Unhitching the trailer, it's deliberate. He threw away his tools. He can't do his job anymore without those tools. He's still a tradesman, so to speak, but he has made it deliberately harder for his job to do his job. Now, what if he was to drive to the next job site? Wouldn't he still have been expected to do his work? Wouldn't you be angry if the person you hired did this? What kind of move is this? Do you understand how boneheaded that was? And this is us. We in Adam, we backed our trailer into the lake and we threw our tools away that we needed to do our job. Now last Sunday, we went over what our job was. It was to know God, to heartily love him, to live with him in eternal blessedness, to glorify him, praise him. But we made doing what's our responsibility hard. We struggle to accept that we have responsibility for Adam's decision. We try to distance ourselves as much as we can When when Romans 5 verse 12 says sin came into the world through one man, yet somehow all men sinned, we don't always see that we took part in the fall. But if we move on in Romans chapter 5 to verses 15 and 16, we hear of the free gift of Christ, and it was different from Adam's sin, yet we see that one man can be responsible for the fate of others. Verse 15 says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more the grace of God and the free gift of grace that the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. 
Don't we, we love to accept the free gift of God? Aren't we ready to take what doesn't belong to us? Grace. Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. This is something that we clearly don't have a natural part in. Unlike the sin of Adam that we try to distance ourselves, but continually we see our similarities with Adam when we sin. We are by nature sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We share in the responsibility to obey God. If we cannot accept the responsibilities for the actions of Adam, which we have a clear part in, we cannot accept the gift of Christ, which we clearly have no part in. And now this leads us to our second point, his justice and our punishment. Question answer 10 asks, will God allow such disobedience and apostasy to go unpunished? The answer is certainly not. Without a doubt, God will punish sin. He has not forgotten about sin. He has not accepted it as part of our lives. He has not come to terms with sin in the world. You may recall that one of God's attributes is that he is just. And because of this, God is terribly angry with our sins. God has wrath against wickedness. If you read Psalms like Psalm 5, you'll find out how much God hates sin and evildoers. God promises to execute his justice against the wicked. If you look in God's word, you will find that our God is a consuming fire. Answer 10 says not that he's just angry, but terribly angry. He's angry with our original sin as well as our actual sins. Original sin is a grave insult to God. Willful disobedience in a perfect world, a world made just for you. What kind of sin is that? Our original sin is with us from conception. If we read Psalm 51, verse 5, David wrote, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. When he was faced with his sin with Bathsheba, he identified the root of his sin was in his own nature. When life begins, sin begins. All of us are conceived and born in sin. This is the source of of our problems and sin, and also our condemnation. Canons of Dort, chap chapter 1, article 1, says in, in paraphrase that we are under the curse of original sin, which deserves eternal death. Not only that, God has no obligation to remove this curse from you. God could have left the entire human race in hell because of original sin. This would be justice. That's what the article says. And that's just our original sins. We add to our condemnation. We stoke the fire of our own condemnation by adding our daily sins as if our original sins were not enough. We do more damage when we try to serve ourselves rather than God, when we don't honor the marriage bed and we watch things that we know we should not, when we abuse drugs or don't use alcohol responsibly, those times when we let our anger control our words and our actions, when we lead people along with our false words and our promises that are made out of error, the times when we want what we can't have and we make ourselves and others miserable because of our desire. We add and add to our eternal death sentence. Psalm 51 verse 3, David says, My sin is ever before me. All his sin angers God and God he doesn't take our excuses. I was lonely. I was frustrated. I was anxious. I just needed to unwind. 
I was raised this way. All these excuses for our sins don't change a thing. No sinful excuse can get us out of hell. God hates sin. He hates our sin. And answer 10 says, therefore, he will punish them. Sin will be punished. It's not a may. God's plan is to bring judgment on sin. It, it always has been. And it's, it's easy for us to talk about how, God, how much God loves and, 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 and his character of love or the beauty of the creation around us, how wonderful what he has done in creation is. But just as real as the creation is in front of us, so real is his plan to punish sin. Hell is real. Jesus talks about it in the Gospels throughout it. Now his goal is to keep us out of hell, but he wants us to know about it. When he describes hell, Jesus often uses three images. One of them is being cast into a fiery furnace. Like in Matthew 13, the verses 42 and 50, hell will have physical pain. Hell is going to hurt. And the second common image is the gnashing of teeth. Now we would say something like clenching your jaw or grinding your teeth. And the number one reason why people grind their teeth is because of stress and anxiety. Hell will be mental suffering. To add the third image, it will be dark in hell. We know that in the new creation, the only source of light will be God, and those who are in hell will not see this light. There is a spiritual aspect here that we can't fully comprehend what hell will be like, fully. But the word of God promises that it will be very real. God is going to give a just judgment. We know that of our nature and of our actions, we are sinners. We deserve hell. God owes us nothing. Galatians 3.10 says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law. Brothers and sisters, do you feel the weight of this curse? Our obedience is never enough. Our little stacks of righteousness can never repay our actual sins, let alone the deep damage of original sin. We can't obey our way out of hell. We need to understand the reality of hell. It's all horror all the time. And not only is it real, it's, it's where we belong by nature. Because of our sin, we have personally offended God, the just and the powerful. We are guilty. We belong in hell. There is no denying that our sin condemns us. Does this reality frighten you? It should. And this brings us to our third point, his justice and at the same time, his mercy. If we have generally, genuinely considered our places, place in hell, the cry of question 11 comes very easily to us. Is God not also merciful? We hear right away what we want to hear in answer 11. God is indeed merciful. How soothing is that to hear? Considering our place in hell, that is music to our ears. But the answer does not end there. Catechism says he is also just. God's justice and his mercy are not competing forces. His justice is merciful and his mercy is just. We will find that God does not trade one for the other, but he executes both perfectly. Now, mercy, it is not the same as accepting an apology. Mercy is withholding the proper consequences of someone else's action. It's not giving someone what they deserve. And justice, justice is doing what is right. And a just judgment 
is giving someone what they deserve. Now, these are concepts we, we struggle to execute and sometimes struggle to understand. Yet we know God does both perfectly at the same time. Now, mercy, it's something that we're eager to accept. In a situation where we are without power, we say they, we are at their mercy. But when someone owes us something that we, we truly deserve, it's very hard for us to be merciful. We want our just reward. We want what we are owed. We want justice. When people hurt us, we demand that they should be punished. We expect that. We love justice when it benefits us especially. Our sense of justice is is based on what offends us or the rules that we have learned. But God has justice as his character. It's not a a concept that he, he, he uses or something that's been imposed on him. God is just. God is the only judge who makes the law, keeps the law, and enforces the law all at once and all perfectly. To break the law is to sin against him. David wrote in Psalm 51 verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and and have done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. God is the lawgiver, and when you sin, you mock the one who is blameless. Answer 11 describes this as the most high majesty of God. We need to know who God is, who we are sinning against. Remember all those sermons on Belgian Confession, Article 1. You learned who God is as a congregation. And he doesn't deserve what you're doing to him by your sin. God is good and his justice is good. What king would ignore rebels who constantly attack his kingdom? The king has provided everything these citizens would need to live a good and a happy life, but they have rebelled against him. Isn't it fitting that a good king would would punish these rebels? He would put to death those who, who desire his death and the destruction of his kingdom. The king is just when he kills these rebels. How much greater is God and his goodness? Should his punishment not be more severe? We've talked about hell as being for the body, the mind, and the soul. And now... In verse 11, it says it is eternal as well. It's not just a short sentence. Hell doesn't have an end date to look forward to. There's no five o'clock on Friday in hell. It will not end. The suffering will be brutal. And if you consider how how worldly governments have punished evil criminals in, in history, We know there are creative ways to make people suffer and even to make it last longer. Yet in Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Certainly hell will be worse than anything we have seen or heard. God is coming injustice. God has a goal to put an end to evil, to end sin, to punish body and soul forevermore. In Galatians 3.10, we read that we are under a curse because we cannot keep the law. But that's not all Galatians 3 tells us. Verse 11, we read, the righteous shall live by faith. We do, not believe, we do not live before God in our works, but we live in faith. And verse 13 tells us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a, the curse for us. He took on our flesh without original sin by being born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus took 
our flesh that was weakened by our sin and God's justice was executed on him perfectly. All our sins, every sin that God knows about each and every one of us was punished in Jesus' flesh. He took our hell for us. The physical pain, the nails in his hands, the lashes of the whip, the hellish mental anguish that caused him to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The darkness that surrounded him for three hours, like the outer darkness of hell. Galatians 3.13 says, the one who cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. And we stand here today, looking at that cross, seeing our curse up there, taken off our shoulders. We have seen God's justice and mercy on the cross. God's justice was satisfied by Jesus' painful death, where our sins, all of them, have been paid for. At the same time, God showed his great mercy by putting our sins there on Jesus Christ. We who deserved eternal death were spared by the mercy of God's gift to us, his only son. This is the promise for those who believe. If anyone does not believe this, they will not be spared. If you do not believe, you are still under this curse. Believers, believers, we are no longer under the curse. We will not face the same judgment anymore. How amazing is this? What can you say about this? The judgment we will, we will meet is not the same one. Our judgment will come from the same one who took our sin away from us, who took our punishment for us. How readily would you want to meet that coming judge? Our coming judge, he knows all of our sins and he was judged for them. He has removed all of our sins from the sight of God. And this is your coming judge. He is your risen Savior. How great is the justice and the mercy of God. Are you in awe of what Jesus Christ has done for you? Brothers and sisters, praise God, for he is just and he is merciful. Amen.